Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 115, 115 of the Board Game Barrage podcast. I'm your host, Neelan, and with me, as always, are my co-hosts, Mark and Kellen. Mark, go Green Tank. Hello. You said go Green Tank? I said the Green Tank. Oh, yes, and go Green Tank. Hey, hi. Kellen. I am with you, as always, but I am... Six feet away from you, Neon. Yeah, we're we're maintaining the appropriate distance in our current crisis. I finally have an excuse to stay away from you guys. It is true. Neon's a, a hugger. A government mandated excuse. I think I'm the most huggery of the three. Yeah, that's true. But it would have been funnier if we could have convinced right. them that it was you've ever Neelan. hugged me. Oh, Oof. well, that tells you a lot about our relationship. Yeah, I think Christina, the blue tank, might be the sure. hugger of us all. Of but... the three, I. I prefaced it as of, oh, of of what do you did you say of the core three why don't you say I, something <laughs> i mean she's listening so <laughs> today on the show we're going to be talking about the best games that we've gotten rid of we haven't done a top five list in a long time so this is a return to the beloved format that we invented that we invented top. exactly five top five top five top five top five Top five, top, top five, five, top five. Top five. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> That's going to be coming up later in the show. Before we get there, let's talk about the games that we've been playing. Kellen, what have you been playing? So I wanted to share some of my passion this past week with Neilan. Um, You know, he is constantly going, why don't we play Dino World? Why don't we play Quacks of Quedlinburg? Pretty much every day. And I think, no, what does Neelan need in his life more? The only true and living doctor, Reina Knizia. So today we introduced Neelan to Through the Desert. You may have heard us talk about Through the Desert because we frequently talk about Blue Lagoon. Blue Lagoon being a Reiner Knizia game that has come out in the past two years. That is a more Euro version um, in many ways of Through the Desert. In Through the Desert, you are playing a Go-like game of Camel Caravans. So there are these beautiful pastel-colored camels. Everyone is in control of a caravan of each color, and you're moving them around on the board, trying to go to oasises, trying to go to watering holes, and also trying to sort of enclose areas of the board. What makes it different, what makes it interesting, is the fact that my purple camel blocks Neelan from placing a purple camel. You can never join the same color caravans. So... Neelan could put his green camel right next to my purple camel caravan. And so those can run simultaneously right next to each other. So you're competing over so many different routes all at once and trying to figure out how to score the most points while also inflicting the most pain on the people that you're playing with. We played through a full game of this in 30 minutes or less. Including the teach, I would say. Including teaching the game. Thank you, Neelan. And I really love this one. I think that it feels like a longer game that only takes 30 minutes. It is a filler length game that is way more than that. I really like Through the Desert. Neilan, why don't you tell us as a newcomer how you feel and Mark how your revisit felt afterwards. I really enjoyed it. Obviously, I think the Blue Lagoon comparison is pretty apt. It's a game where the only mechanic is simplicity itself. Find a spot to place a piece, but you are simultaneously, as you said, competing over what feels like five competing objectives, as it were. Because by sort of going hard into one, you're kind of foregoing your opportunities for others. I did like the element of cutting off areas of the board. This is something that Blue Lagoon doesn't have. Blue Lagoon is purely about the route building and sort of getting to precise locations. But through the desert sort of allows you to cordon off areas of the board for potentially very big point grabs. I mean, I I dare say that's the reason Kellen won our game of it was he was getting 30 odd points through just cordoning off areas of the board. I like that consideration a whole lot because you're forced to think about the game as high value sections rather than just where can I get to with my camels, which is like I said, something that is pretty specific to Blue Lagoon. I do think it would require more plays of Through the Desert for this to surpass Blue Lagoon, which is a game I played a fair bit, but I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was interesting for me having played this a while back and not having played it since playing Blue Lagoon a number of times. I was of the mindset that one would replace the other. When I had a chance to play both of them, in a short time frame, I felt like when I get a chance to play through the desert again, I'll be able to tell which of these two I would keep. And interestingly, after having played through the desert now um, for the first time in a while, I feel like there's 
sort of space for both. Through the Desert is much more stripped down, much more straightforward rule set. It is that sort of just, as Neilan was saying, like spatial control, basically. Whereas Blue Lagoon, you have a lot of different things to consider in terms of things to pick up along the way. You have things to consider in Through the Desert, but it seems the things you're considering Through the Desert seem to be all sort of of the same type, for lack of a better term. But I feel like I could go back to playing Blue Lagoon and then play Through the Desert and have different enough experiences that I can see a spot for both in a collection. They both have this thing, this mechanism that I was trying to describe to both of them off the air, where you set up um, what you're trying to do on the board and you need to put a few more camels in place to complete that route. But you don't have to complete it until someone forces you to, you know, because your resources are better spent somewhere else in this moment. But if Mark encroaches, okay, then I have to finish that off. And so the game is this series of you're setting up three or four or five of those where it's like, okay, if someone goes over there, I need to block that off. If Neilan comes over here, I have to block that off. And then suddenly there are four or five considerations that you're trying to make and someone will press you on one and then someone will press you on the other. And then you have to decide which one is more important. Mark and I got in a battle over the largest caravan, which is a bonus for the most of one color. So he spent the second to last turn of the game increasing his caravan to ensure he would get that 10 point bonus. But he only needed one more camel to complete a little mini route that would have given him eight more points. So he had just left that open thinking, I'll be able to get back to that eventually. And then something more pressing came up and you had to pivot away from it. Right. And then I was like, well, I can't do anything right now. So I'm going to end the game before you're able to complete that. And I love that style of thinking. Yeah, going for that purple camel caravan that we were fighting over. But in making the move to go for that, I sacrificed another caravan, the blue caravan, to Neelan, basically. Constantly achieving something, knowing you're potentially sacrificing some other aspect of the scoring. Yeah, and I went big on the caravan that won me the game, blocking off probably the biggest chunk of the board. Yeah. But by the time I had done that, one-fourth of the way through the game, they had surrounded one of my camel caravan leaders, and Homeboy got to do nothing. <laughs> he literally could not move. And so his sacrifice was not in vain as I emerged victorious uh, in the only true and living Dr. Reiner Knizia's Through the Desert, a fantastic version of it printed by Z-Man Games. Yeah, it's beautiful as well. So I'm going to quick hit something which was a revisit for Callan and I. So the last time the two of us played Lords of Hellas, we discovered it was actually 18 months ago. In the intervening time, it's a game that I've been itching to play more of because what's happened since the last time we played is the second wave Kickstarter stuff came. So the way that they had done their shipping is they ship one box and they ship the Kickstarter extras later. So I'd been curious to see whether there was anything in the extras that was worth throwing into the game. And I was a little bit disappointed to discover that most people recommend you just play with extra heroes and not much else. Lords of Hellas is a, I would say, mostly area control game by Awaken Realms. It has four different win conditions, most of them to do with territory control and another to do with hunting monsters. So you have a hero that can roam around the map and kill these monsters in this weird little minigame. Um, I was surprised at how much this sort of fell flat in this game. Uh, it was the Blue Tank Christina's first time playing it, and we had both expected her to really enjoy it because it's in that wheelhouse that we tend to love of those dudes in the map, mini heavy area control fighty games. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the ways to take one of those games that sometimes would take too long is you play it at three players with a group of people who are ready to beat up on each other and it goes quick and everyone has sort of a light jovial time which is what we were hoping to have lords of hellas is messy um, yeah. and i think the last time we talked about it we did talk about it being sort of messy messy in a more it leans more ameritrash in many ways than some of the greats that we love and this most recent play for me proved out two episodes ago we spoke at length about our favorite area control games this is one million percent not one of them it has too much LOL random power-ups, and every couple rounds, everyone is getting blessings. And then these blessings just give you special abilities that no one else can counteract. They are very fun, but they are very annoying. Different mechanisms in the game are very disparate. When you go on the hunt, everyone just has to sit there and watch you go on the hunt. So the mini game that Christina and Neelan were playing while I was going on the hunt was talk Kellen um, <laughs> and tell me to hurry up. Even though it's like a long... Pro like There's nothing I could do to make it go faster. 
And in addition to that, the way in which the special action system works is sort of reminiscent in some ways of Scythe or other games. You're choosing one special action, and then you can't do any of them until another action is taken that wipes all of them. But it's this way in which the game enforces a mini narrative on the players. So rather than allowing you to march whenever you want to march and attack another player, it's actually like, no, if you want to keep marching, you have to march. Then next turn, you clear your board, and then you can march. And it's just less... It's annoying. It, yeah, it's it, annoying. It, it, How it, about that? It's annoying. I mean, no, but I, I agree with you because I, I think the thing is that we both were saying after that particular game is that there were frequent times where it's like, okay, the game has a lot of stuff in it and it's kind of like, this should be fun and this should be fun and this should be fun, but it restricts your ability to engage with the fun at all times. I genuinely like puzzle mechanisms that, you know, in your words, would gate your ability to do things. And part of the game to me is figuring out the optimal way to perform those actions. This is the one time where it just felt like it was getting in the way of the fun. It's hard because I think that Lords of Hellas does a lot of stuff that I like, but I think this game proved its fragility in a way, which is that one of the key things that happened in our game is that Kellen had this very early start, purely through card draw to some extent. Beautiful strategic play. <laughs> and that basically... I believed in the heart of the cards. <laughs> and that's that's like what fueled your winning in a way that we couldn't stop. Hunting as a end game condition continues to seem like a problem. It was like, Mark, so there's this mechanism where you go on quests, right? Oh, and you've played it. Yeah. And you're only allowed to move your hero as many spaces as your speed. And they both had one speed, and I had five speed. Right. So Christina, I think at one point, took like two or three turns to walk towards the quest, <laughs> and I got off another quest oh and just God. literally Forget. ran past her. <laughs> and this was after like being in the game 30 minutes, you yeah. know, and somehow I'm like way up there. Sure. Oh, that was a good moment. It was weird. I think Lords of Hellas is shocking in how much it manages to streamline all of the different systems in it. It works better than it should, given how much is going on. Right. One of the comparisons I have in my head is their other game, which is Nemesis, which has a lot of stuff and doesn't work well because of all the stuff and because of the rule set. I do think how it comes together cleaner than that, but it perhaps is this close to suffering from the same problem. And that will manifest in some games more than others. I think my my main takeaway is that compared to games that we played a lot more recently in the genre, games like Inish, games like Thule Wars, games like Mezzo, this just doesn't cut it for me anymore. So I think, and this is going to be super relevant to this episode, Lords of Hellas is out of my collection. Thank you for your service, paying and backing for the game, including Waves 1 and 2 shipping, so that I did not have to. <laughs> you were trying to convince me not to for the longest time. I should have listened. Oh, yeah. And then I felt bad when it came and all these positive people were reviews like were happening. Positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, that didn't look good. These people are... <laughs> I also want to talk about a game that I've been itching to play for a very long time. So, Kellen, Christina, and I also played Toi, or as I believe the original French pronunciation is Troyes. Troyes, yeah. Is that right, Mark? Toi is a game that is primarily a dice drafting game that doesn't quite feel like any other dice drafting game I've played, at least, because the dice you draft are sort of allocated to certain players. So Kellen will roll his pool of dice, Mark will roll his pool of dice, I will roll my pool of dice, but I'm still able to buy the dice from other players. So I might use Kellen's dice before he's able to. The dice are used to allocate towards certain what are called activity cards, which are basically the main actions of the game. So you have to sort of meet certain thresholds in order to get certain actions. Say you wanted to get coins. You would get as many coins as the yellow dice you choose to allocate to that action divided by two. So if I buy Kellen's die and then add it to my own, I might say get a total of 12. I can then use those 12 dice towards this action in order to get 12 coins. But there's a cost towards buying Kellen's dice, so it's like this constant sort of evaluation of how much it's worth buying someone else's dice. Is, do you have the money to support that? And is the action going to pay off? This is going to lead to sort of eventually big combos because some of the cards are in the service of dice manipulation and eventually hopefully towards the end of the game you're getting big combinations of dice that you can then allocate towards certain actions in order to get large point grabs there are also events that play along the bottom that are generally quite hurtful to all the players at the table and part of the game is contributing dice to counter those events in a way that nets you points there's a little bit of an area control element down there but also primarily to stop these events from hurting you because if you don't deal with them they just escalate and escalate and you're having to devote dice purely just to counter 
the attacks on these event cards. One of the things that's super interesting about Twa is that the action cards are different in every game. So I believe that there are different sets of these cards. Is that right? No? Well, so there are red cards that refer to military, yellow cards that refer more towards the economy, and white cards that are building the cathedral and the clergy, and they are in ones and twos and threes. So there will always be a red one, a red two, and a red three. Oh, they're not linked in any way. No. It's not like one, the one, two, and three no. from a set. Oh, oh, oh wow. Okay. That's and, crazier than I thought. Yeah. And then there are, I think, three or four of each number in the base game and then there's also expansion cards so there's yeah there's a ton of variability in the way that these action cards play out and i think a core part of the game is setting up because in the first round of the game only the first action card is available in the second round the next one is available in the third round all three are available and for the fourth and fifth round you're working with what has already been revealed so it is this process of setting up four cards that you don't necessarily know are coming in order to pay off the investments you've put into dice and actions earlier in the game. One of the other things that's also super interesting about Twa is, as in a game like Archipelago, everyone has one of six different scoring cards. So uh, you might, in secret, know that one way to get additional points at the end of the game is to gain influence. As a part of the game is perhaps bluffing what those cards are, trying to evaluate what other people are working towards in order to also benefit off of those scoring cards. So, Kellen, Twa is one of your favorite games. How did you feel playing this again yesterday? So... It made me realize a couple things. Twa is a very specific game for it, a specific type of audience, right? Because the mechanisms that you're using in many ways are Euro-like and reward planning and calculating the efficiency of buying your opponent's dice. But then it combines that with hidden scoring and it combines that with an event deck that could get you. And so the audience that will enjoy this game has to lean into a little bit of that chaos, a little bit of the hecticness of having to deal with card combos that are different every game. And and it may just be that this game, the white card combos are not as good as the red ones, so you have to be willing to adapt. All the while, you're having to watch what your opponents are doing to try to suss out what the victory conditions even are for this game. You know, I had you and Christina going that the influence track was going to be very important at the end of the game, and it was not. And then on the last turn of the game, I just used all that influence to do other more important things on the board. I love Twa, and this game was especially interesting because the event cards, the mean cards that everyone has to deal with together, if you don't deal with them, they stack. They keep going. And there's like, I don't know, six or seven spots on the board, and the rule book is very clear. You can go past this right. with negative events. And none of us pursued a very military-heavy strategy, which means all of our engines were artificially... Not artificially, they were just suppressed. Mm -hmm. We were constantly all getting got over and over and over again. So fulfilling those, you see a new card combo come out, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to score 18 points, and it's going to be glorious. No, because the invaders just kept hitting us over and over again, and no one would commit to fighting them. Yeah. So that made for a very interesting game of Twa, perhaps not the most fulfilling to someone who's never got to see it all sort of go together. And I think that's exactly my, unfortunately, my main takeaway from my first game of this was by your admission, it felt like a very oppressive game of Twa, just by virtue of the fact that, like you said, our engines weren't paying off. When you first explained the game to me, and once we'd gone through the rules, I was so excited about the prospect of like, oh, I can see how this is just going to balloon and balloon into these cool combos later in the game. And for the reason of the events and for other reasons that were just bad planning on my part, that never really paid off to its maximum effect. Uh, and that's unfortunate. Uh, but I think recognizing that that exists and that this was just a odd game of that. See, I would push back on you actually pretty hard. It's like, it's our fault that it did that. It's not the game's... Like, no, it took like to even say, like, it's it was self-inflicted. Sure, that doesn't make it any less unusual, I guess. Well, I, yeah, I think this is a philosophical difference, I think, that we have a little bit, which is like... How much should a game allow you to do all the cool things that you want to do? And I think you lean on the side that, like, we should be getting to do cool things no matter what. And I lean more on the side of, like, you planned poorly and therefore you got got. And then that makes the games where you do figure it out that much better. Sure, but would you say that that's common to, like, most people's initial games of it? Is it something that 
is generally has a harsh learning curve. I mean, because in that case, yeah, I'd, I'd be absolutely willing to accept that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, many people play with the Ladies of Trois, which is an expansion. You know, the, the two harsh points are probably the event cards and then rolling your own dice and wanting to get to use your special six that you rolled and knowing that someone is going to buy it before you is just harsh. Mm -hmm. Every decision in the game is very harsh. And so this game was just buoyed by the event deck. And I guess you could say that the event deck was in part random, right? Because the cards that came out, the specific type of oppressive of the event deck was random. But none of us at any point chose to spend any time working on it. And therefore, we all got caught. Yeah, I think that's valid. I think it certainly highlighted things I would do substantially differently on the second play. It is an interesting idea, right? Which is that should the game just be everyone gets to do cool things and someone does cool things better than everyone else's cool things? One question I had is, uh, in light of the previous discussion we had about Through the Desert versus Blue Lagoon, having now played both these games, both Twa and Black Angel, in semi-rapid succession, what are your thoughts about the comparisons? To me, Twa feels like a cohesive thing. You understand that I'm going to put some workers in here and those workers are going to become dice for me. And then I'm going to put some workers in the barracks and then they're going to get me red dice. And those red dice are going to help me use the red cards in Black Angel. And through limited plays, there was so much going on that the systems felt more disparate to me. And seeing how it all interconnected didn't really ever make sense. And I think that that's been the common criticism between the two of them, where Twa, the complexity comes from having to figure out which decision is most important, not from literally figuring out what's going to happen if I do these things. I think that's right. Like, I think the benefits that Black Angel has in its favor are, I mean, I think the theme is more fun. It's certainly a more vibrant, more colorful game. But like Kellen said, I just, I feel like it, it doesn't feel like all the systems are as intimately connected as was very apparent in even one game of Trois. Yeah. That is going to do it for Trois. Mark, what have you been playing? I played Watergate. Watergate is a two-player card-driven game that sort of uh, feels a lot like other games, most prominently Twilight Struggle and also Fort Sumter. These are games that are card-driven war games where when you play a card, you're playing them either for a point value, sort of an action point value, or for an event on the card. So what you're trying to do in Watergate, it's a two-player game where one person plays the Nixon administration and one player plays the editor of the Washington Post. What the Nixon player is trying to do is win five of these momentum tokens. That's one thing that you are playing this tug of war over. The Washington Post player is trying to, on a board, connect Nixon, who is in the center of this board, to two witnesses who are around the board. So every round, you're playing this tug of war over five objects, three pieces of evidence and two tokens. One token is an initiative token, which uh, if you win, it allows you to go first and have more cards to play. And the other one is a momentum token, which is the Nixon player's end goal. So if the Nixon player in five rounds wins the momentum token five times, they win the game. What you're doing in your turn is you're playing a card. If you play it for the number value, the numeric value, you can tug one of these five objects towards your side of the board. And at the end of the round, anything that is on your side of the board, you win and can place on the board or use for the next round. The other thing you can do is when you play a card, instead of using it for the value, for the point value, you can use it for the event that's printed on the card. Some events are quite powerful. And when you use them, you lose the card for the rest of the game. So they allow you a one-time event that is usually quite powerful, but now you no longer have that card. Those cards usually have a lot of points assigned to them. So, you know, you are taking a big action, but you're never going to be able to use those points again, those action points again. I really enjoyed my first play of Watergate. It reminded me a lot, again, of Twilight Struggle, obviously, because of this action point versus event system. But also, as I said, Fort Sumter, this is, I think, a better game than Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter is also a two-player game. Where I think Watergate shines over Fort Sumter and where I think it shines in general is that the two players have asymmetric decks that play very differently. Fort Sumter, you're sharing a common pool of cards. And also in Fort Sumter, the events you can do and the actions you can take are very incremental. At the end of every round in Fort Sumter, you're winning things by one cube. And it's like everything is very small. With Watergate, and this may be something that degrades over time. Some of the cards are really, really 
powerful and swingy. And the first time you get them, you're like, wow, that's amazing. I can't believe I can do this. You know, and then the question is, do I do this event now and lose the card or wait for a later round to really spring it on your opponent? And this, that's, again, where my concern is, like, once both players know those cards, there's an added value because then, you know, you're playing more new, more nuanced game. But once all the surprises and these big swings are well known, I wonder if that'll decrease the excitement of the game. But again, for the first time out of the box... I did really like the tug of war aspect and, again, these big actions where you're sort of like throwing things on their head. And then, as always, this is a game that features a historical theme and also features part of the rulebook devoted to every single card in the game where you can like read up about the history of the Watergate scandal, which is something that I always like. So that is my big question for Watergate is, you know, let's divorce it from the historical theme. Right. Let's make it... I don't know, Robin Hood theme? Sure. Okay, and King, what's his name? John? Is that his name? Yes. King John, you know, is stealing information. And the editor of the Sherwood Forest Herald. <laughs> and the editor, exactly. And um, you don't play Robin Hood. Right. No. Right, but to be clear, you know, you play a, what was the newspaper Edi- called? The Washington Post. Oh, the, no. the, the Sherwood Forest Herald. You pay an editor of the Sherwood Forest Herald. Yeah. And, you know, it has flavor text. You know, yes. you're learning about what's happening and what happened to the cute Disney princess, Fox right. Girl. But how much would you still love the game? Well, first of all, I know you're joking, but this is sort of an important thing to me is like when it comes to flavor text, the kind of flavor text I like is the historical stuff. Like if it's like a fantasy thing, that's nothing I'm not interested in. So, I mean, again, kidding aside, like if this was about, you know, Robin or something, I would not be interested in flavor text, no matter how good it is, because... But from game. Yeah, right. No, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to oh, that. Oh, I, I rushed you. You rushed me. But th- for me, the hook of these kind of flavor texts is the historical aspect of it. So that aside, yeah, no, I think it stands on its own as a game for sure. Because the swings that you do, the powers that you do on these cards don't necessarily translate one-to-one to things that happened in, in the event. So like somebody's card giving you like two evidence tokens, like there is a very light tenuous connection between the card powers and the events in the game but it's certainly not required and the actions you're doing in the game don't really transport you to you know the watergate scandal it stands alone as a game the theme enhances it but does feel pasted on so here's a, a somewhat related question yeah it might shock you to discover that i'm not american <laughs> I don't, i'm not like intimately familiar in all honesty yeah. with with the watergate scandal yeah. would i as someone playing the game and maybe without reading the flavor text extensively would i be interested in finding out more does it inject enough of the flavor without me diving super deeply into it that i would be intrigued by it that's, i would get like, some of the flavor uh, my guess is that's very player dependent but for the average player i would say no okay maybe the asymmetricness of it the fact that both players play super differently would prompt you to to get more into the historical theme and the witnesses are very prominent both players are trying to either suppress the witnesses or get to the witnesses so that might spur you on to it but i think on its own you'd have to have some historical inclination to want to get into it but i think it stands alone stands on its own as a game i don't think watergate is a theme that people are clamoring for right well, that's it exactly yeah it. right it, it kind of has to do a lot of work as a theme right. to to be engaging and that, that's the thing i'm curious about yeah Is like it? i mean i would ask like twilight struggle in terms of the theme does it do anything for you I would say to some extent, like the Cold yeah. War in general, yeah. So this maybe is like a step away from it because it's more American-centric. So maybe that's it's less interesting to somebody who's not American. Which but side did you play? I played as Nixon, of course. You helped Nixon Tricky Dick. get away with it? I didn't get away with it. The editor got me. He connected the dots. Is it just like in the rule book and then Nixon got away with it if he wins? Well, I don't think that's the exact verbiage, but that's the idea. Like you, you sort of like... Then next week... The Sherwood Forest Gazette got him. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Nixon was fighting on two fronts. <laughs> so that is Watergate by Capstone Games. We can't change history, Mark. But we can try. Time chase. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into our feature topic for this week. We're going to be talking about games that have left our collection, specifically the best games that have left our collection, We're going to be digging into the reasons why we got rid of them and why we maybe have a little bit of a pang to get them back, who can say. Kellen, you got pangs? Never had one before. (laughs) Let's get right into it with 
Kellen, what is your number five game you got rid of? My number five game that I got rid of, we actually talked about on an episode a long time ago uh, as, yes. as I was getting rid of it. <laughs> based on that, based on we talked about it long ago. Yeah. Well, I got, <laughs> well, come on. I got nothing. This is Yamatai. Hmm. Uh, Yamatai is a Days of Wonder, one of their yearly releases. This is a... Japanese-themed game they got rid of. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, wow, wow. Who would um, thought? Yamatai is a very straightforward game about um, building uh, ship routes on a board that help you complete buildings. This is one of those less than you know 90-minute games that is bright, is colorful. Everyone is having fun the whole time. No one is doing too much mean interaction with each other there's beautiful art and you're getting special powers that's sort of the fun of the game this one came and went i enjoyed having it in my collection and there's been a couple times where i said you know what would go good right now yamatai yamatai and i don't have it anymore because it is a good game uh, that i got rid of which is why it is making my list here in the fifth rank slot you have both played yamatai yeah I haven't actually. BarageCon. Yeah. Did Barrage you play Con. with this? Yeah, yeah it was I fun. Rem- yeah, I fun. remember looking over it. It looked beautiful. I remember it being like surprisingly mean. Like I remember having a little bit of bite. The distance makes the heart grow fond. <laughs> 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 my number five game, I get my pang from my recent string of playing games by this designer, Friedman Frisa. I've become a Frisa head over the last couple months, and now I'm wondering if I should have gotten rid of my copy of Power Grid, which is, I think, his masterpiece, most people would consider it. I don't think I will end up tracking it down because it just does feel a little too mathy for me, although I generally like math games. But the one thing about Power Grid that really hurts it for me is that idea that the optimal play is often not to play your best. To not be in first place. Not to be in first place. And I just, I always hated that aspect of it. And so I don't think it'll come back into my collection, but I am a bit much bigger fan of Mr. Frieza than I was when I got rid of Power Grid. That one, especially on the last turn, you literally need a calculator. Yeah, right. And then I have a friend who has colored calculators for each player oh, really? That's in the box for Power Grid. But the auctions in that are really fun. Yeah. yeah. And, you yeah. know, some people are into green energy. Some people are into coal energy. And then I've heard some of the variant maps even do really crazy things with sure. the market yeah. to make it like there's like a communist market in one of right. them and stuff. And so... I could see a group really diving of course, deep on Power absolutely. Grid. I also have played, in the last couple of months, uh, Power Grid, the card game, and I did really, really enjoy that. So maybe that is an alternative that I would uh, consider picking up. But that's my number five, Power Grid. You didn't play that with us. I did not. I would have wanted to have been invited. The pangs. <laughs> my number five game is Indian Summer. And this is going to be a little bit hypocritical because i think when i we spoke about this last time i mentioned that this had replaced baron park for me i know and i'm looking I've, <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm looking. You'll, you'll notice baron park is still around yes and indian summer has left my collection i really like indian summer but i do think that there is kind of a lot to be just said for just the cuteness value of baron park and how the theme is just so much more vibrant and colorful and fun and interesting then Indian Summer, which just kind of has this vague leaves. It's a much... Dr- That's the theme. Yeah, That's yeah, literally yeah. <laughs> the theme of Indian Summer. Is You're placing leaves on like a nature trail, I guess. I don't know. It's pretty vague and it's a lot drier by virtue of that. By while being largely the same type of game of choosing a tile, a polyomino tile, drafting it and placing it on your board somewhere. Baron Park just feels more fun and more quick. And it's easier to explain. There are sort of like rules, nuances to Indian Summer that are a little bit odd. Having both games in my collection, I just sort of felt much more drawn to playing more Baron Park than I did Indian Summer. And that's kind of the reason I got rid of it. I don't think it made sense to have both. And Indian Summer is the one that got the cut. You hurt Mr. Rosenberg by getting rid of Indian Summer, but then you caressed him in consolation by getting his new game, Nova Luna. Not I've true. never caressed him. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about Neelan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> true. He's a hugger. I wonder if we got rid of setup times completely, what games would change in our rankings so you could snap your finger, play the game, because Baron Park would probably jump up a point and a half. It's a pain in the... Bear. Bear, but to set up. Yeah. And I got rid of it because of that. My number four, best game, good game, best game that I got rid of is Crosstalk. Crosstalk is a word party game that I really like. uh, And this is a difficult choice. And Christina did not use her veto on it. 
thank goodness. But Crosstalk is a game in which each team is trying to get their team to guess the secret word, but everyone is able to give one special clue before the round starts that sort of tries to make that connection in your head. If you think of code names, you have one extra word that might link it all together. It is, in many ways, this weird, similar amalgamation to code names and Decrypto. And Decrypto and Crosstalk both came out around the same time. I really enjoy Crosstalk. I would not turn down a game of Crosstalk, but I ultimately would prefer to play code names with a simpler crowd and Decrypto with a smarter crowd. And therefore, Crosstalk, a great game that has left the collection. My number four is... Oh, we're going to be... This is another Uwe game, so... Another shot at Mr. Rosenberg. This is one his... more hug for Mr. Rosenberg. Yeah, we'll have to give him another hug after this shot in the gut that I'm giving him right now. A little shot in the gut. A tank shot. Tank shot. That's right. Tank shot. I have gotten rid of his classic Agricola. I've talked about reasons why I've done this before. Excuse me? Agricola. This is one of your top 50 games. Agricola. Agricola. And I got rid of it. I've mentioned why in previous podcasts, but uh, the people who I'd be playing this with, most of them are very, very good at it. And they would crush me immediately, and I don't like being crushed. Mark doesn't keep games he's bad at. That's right, exactly. So out it went. No, I appreciate it. I can't win this game. (laughs) That's right. Yeah, that's right. No, I I do appreciate it. And I would even consider at some point reacquiring it just because I I know how well-crafted it is. But for right now, when it came time to make trades and to sell off games, uh, Agricola was one that I was able to part with. We're trying to be lighter and kinder, you know, in the spirit of the season. So hopefully that's coming through for you all. (laughs) (laughs) The number four game that I got rid of is The Thing, Infectionate Outpost 31. Oh, thank goodness. No, shush. This is still... (laughs) What do you mean, no shush? So Battlestar Galactica is a fantastic game cooperative game uh, with a traitor element, but it's a very, very long game. It takes three hours plus, and you sort of have to be married to the theme, I think, to get the most out of it. I had been seeking a, a replacement for this type of game, this sort of hidden traitor cooperative game for the longest time, and I would still maintain that to date, the thing, Infection and Outpost 31, is the best version of that in a much shorter game. It is a game of moving around a board, finding objects in order to fight the thing, but some of you are secretly infected and working against the rest of the crew. Uh, I always just love that mechanic. This is simply a case of a game that I just played out enough. The group I'd been playing it with had played it enough that it was just time to move on to something else. I'm still always looking for a replacement to this. I'm going to keep looking for more versions of this mechanic. I do like hidden traitor games in general there are a couple of new games that come out in this genre every so often and i'm still going to keep checking them out but my time with the thing infection at outpost 31 is done that is my number four game i still have that so oh. we still have it in the oh, we still have it in the in combined the, collection the and you, you got the, you got the, the title wrong it's the thing Outpost at infection. It, was it infection at outpost thirty one? Infection at outpost thirty one. Trading and negotiation oh, yeah. in the Elysium Quadrant. Right, right, right. That's a joke because the title's already long. So I made a joke that make it longer. I was just like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> people will get that. Pod, people, call, people listening to the show will, will laugh. They're call, laughing now. They're it's a callback to nothing. Laughing now. It's a callback to nothing, Mark. Comedy is not all about callbacks. Mm. What are we, the Family Guy? <laughs> Boom! Took another shot. <laughs> Seth MacFarlane shot in the gut. All right. Boom. All right. Um, this. One is going to make people shoot themselves in the gun. <laughs> Wait, what? Themselves in the gun? <laughs> you just said, sh- I don't know. I said punch. That- oh, shot. Oh. Shot. Like a... Okay. Oh, that's a punch. I'm going to punch in the gut. Oh. I was thinking much differently. Okay. Because <laughs> that does take him out, Mark. <laughs> what? A shot in the gut. Yeah, that is... Yeah. They're gone. I'm not trying to make him... All right. I'm just trying to make him feel it. My number three game that I got rid of is actually a series of games and expansions. Uh, This is Dominion. Dominion is uh, my modern entrance re-entrance. You know, kind of like when you leave the party as the cool kid and then you come back to the party. Anyway, I had Dominion. I had Dominion Intrigue and Dominion Seaside in a custom case where you could pull out kingdom cards and build the sets of 10. I played it and I played it and I played it. This may just be a set, a game that I have played too many times. Um, it's one Christina has been interested in potentially playing at some point. I think that with Dominion, I could be convinced by someone on our Discord or one of you to pick up the base game and one new expansion to just 
try it through again. But this straight deck building is pure and interesting, but leaves me feeling without... There aren't very many high highs in a deck builder. It's all very smooth, in my opinion. And therefore, I have gotten rid of Dominion. My number three. My number three is, I think, the top one of the top five games on BGG. This is Terraforming Mars. This is a game that... I have been reconsidering picking back up now that the expansions come out. Usually I'm not a person who is drawn to expansions, but I've heard good things about pretty much all of them. And I've also heard people talk about how much the drafting variant is a necessity if you want to play this game to its fullest. I still don't know if that's enough to make me get it because the game, I think, already runs a little long as it is, and the drafting would just make that even longer experience. But... There are a lot of people who rave about this game, and even my couple plays prior to getting rid of the game, I could see something there, but Terraforming Mars is a game where I think I'm going to look into what the expansions do and see if they're enough to make me pick it back up, because I know there's a lot of fans out there for the game, so uh, Terraforming Mars is my number three game. My number three game is Forbidden Stars. God, I love the Warhammer 40,000 universe, and I think that Forbidden Stars does something that few games set in the universe does, which is it widens the scale of the story, for lack of a better word. Warhammer 40,000 is traditionally a skirmish miniatures game, and Forbidden Stars expands that war to literally across the stars. Like, you are setting up bases on planets, you are moving to other planets in order to capture the objectives you need. It features such a unique reverse order setting mechanism, which does something I don't see in very many games where it allows for responding to aggression. So, for example, you would see that Kellen places his order on a planet close to my base. I'm like, oh, I don't know what that order is because it's placed face down. But I now have the ability to respond to that because of the way that orders reveal themselves in reverse order of placement. So you're sort of placing your first orders last. So the ones that are on top of the stack execute earlier. So it allows you to preemptively set up response to aggression that you're seeing coming from, from afar, which feels appropriate for the scale of the game. Like you see this massive fleet moving towards you and you have the time to prepare for it. Unfortunately, Forbidden Stars is a extremely long game. Even in two players, you're looking at three to four hours, probably, for it. I've heard Kellen tell of a game that took him eight hours? I think it was longer at a convention, honestly. The programmed movement stuff is actually like my least favorite part of it. I, I like but, that and so that's, much. That makes sense, because it's a puzzle to get your pieces on the board. It's programmed movement, except it's the most brain burny version of that that you could possibly do, where you're having to like reverse plan out the spring that mm-hmm. then all unloads over the turns. Neil and smile. No, I, I, I love it. it. It's a, I, I, that's one of the things I love about it. Yeah. It was also a game that does this sort of scale better than any others because it's massive fleets and massive starships and tanks and troops. It's just all out war replicated in a board game. But I do not have the time to play Forbidden Stars, even with people that would probably really, really love it. That one's very hard to get right now. There's always rumors of that being rethemed and put in perhaps the Red Twilight Force. Imperium universe. Yeah, yeah, I believe that the designer has said as much that they're working on the the retheme for it. I'm pretty sure the designer came up to us while we were playing it at Origin. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> anyway, my number two best board game that I have gotten rid of is a Sandy Peterson game. Mark? What? What do you mean, not what? I, that was, you're supposed to say a Sandy Peterson game. I'm supposed to say it after you say it? I don't know. I don't know. We didn't, we didn't plan it. I don't know. Okay. This How do you is, feel about giving a punch, a gut punch to Mr. Sandy Peterson? Well, he doesn't like <laughs> me. Um, so this is Glorantha, The God's War, uh, a Sandy Peterson game. There you go. Glorantha is Cthulhu Wars in another skin. It is 80% or 85% the same game as Cthulhu Wars. I already have Cthulhu Wars. I already have all of Cthulhu's friends in the form of expansions. I could not keep both. I knew that going in. I knew I was going to be taking a financial bath. And I have taken that bath. I have sold uh, (laughs) Glorantha at uh, Dice Tower West. It is a very good game. And if I did not have Cthulhu Wars and I played both of them, I'd probably still choose Cthulhu Wars. But it's a very close thing. I think this is a fantastic game. If you see Glorantha and you like dudes on a map game, you like asymmetric player powers, you like fighting over area control, this is a very interesting game to take a look at. My number two is another top 10 game, maybe top 15 game on BGG. Uh, This is a gut punch to 
Mr. Mark Bigney, because I know he's a big fan of it. This is Spirit Island. I see why a lot of people love this game. I thought it would be the game that would fix the quarterbacking issue for me, and I, I know that it does dampen it, but it still didn't do enough for me to remedy the problem. I still feel like there's a quarterbacking issue a little bit. Uh, I know that everybody's sort of concerned with their own powers, but maybe it's just that I am enjoying these longer co-op games less and less. I like co-op games if they're short, if they're sort of party vibe, but I think I think I just don't enjoy longer co-op games, and I think that's what it is, probably. It's like the audience for Spirit Island is advanced gamers, yeah. right? So you're starting sure. there that want to play a two-hour-plus game. Yeah. And so you've got advanced gamers. You've got more than two hours to play with them. I want to fight. You know, it's on. Yeah, Hansa right. Teutonica, baby. Yeah, El Grande. Right. Like, we're playing. Yeah. You know, we're gaming. That's we, probably it. We, yeah. we don't have time for this. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it. I think if I've got people who are looking for a, a heavier game or, you know, a more hobby-esque game uh, and I've got the time, I do want something that's that I enjoy more than us trying to solve a puzzle together. The art is incredible. The, the names of the gods I still love so much. And I can see why people who like co-op games would love this game. But it's just uh, it's probably the, the nail in the coffin for me for co-op games probably in general. But that is my number two game, Spirit Island. My number two game is a game that I was devastated to admit had to leave my collection. This was Mage Knight. Uh, similarly to Forbidden Stars, it is too long but mage knight has a much bigger problem which is that the rules grit is so severe that every time i was playing it i felt i had to just study for an hour just to relearn how to play mage knight it is quite a complex game it is probably one of the heaviest games in terms of rules that i've played it is considered to be one of vlad Akhvatil's best games and i i did enjoy my time with it i just Every time I would look at the box, I would just be weighed down by the idea of having to relearn it and have to set it up and then commit myself to a three, four hour game. I want to see the game that sort of captures that here is a might and magic type vibe, which is a PC game I grew up loving. And I'd like to see a game that sort of does a similar thing in a substantially reduced rule set and in a shorter amount of time. And nothing has quite come along yet, to my knowledge, at least. Major Lights is ironically a game that I think I would appreciate more in digital form, despite the fact that it is based on video games. But like Through the Ages, if they made an app for Major Knight, I would be devouring it. What if there was a Major Knight in space? Um, I would... You know what? That actually exists. I know, and I have it. Uh, wait, really? I, I you paid have it for it. Yeah. Oh, that's quite funny. There's yeah, a there's a Star Trek re it's Star Trek Frontier. I, I, I freaking love Star Trek, so it's actually surprising I've not played this there yet. There you go. But anyway, that's Mage Knight. I was very sad to have to get rid of it, but I hadn't played it in years, and I was not in danger of playing it anytime soon. Speaking of in space, my number one favorite game that I have gotten rid of is one that I don't think either of you have ever played, and that is Arcadia Quest. I have not. Arcadia Quest is... Wait, why? Speaking of in space. Let me finish a joke, for <laughs> God's sake. Um, Arcadia Quest is a game where you have three heroes, and you draft them at the beginning of the game. They all have little special powers, and then you run a campaign. A campaign is a series of five missions, and in between each mission, you upgrade your weapons, you use the loot that you got, whoever slayed the boss gets a sword from the boss, and it's just light enough to make this work for me. Because if you know the games that I like, you would say, well, Kellen, I don't know why you would like that. This is just so light that it works. But in addition to each mission having different player versus environment objectives, you can also kill each other. So there's PvP combat in addition to those PvE objectives. So it's hilarious because Neelan's like, no, Callan, just let me go get the sword. And I'm like, no, bro, I'm going to have you get the sword and then I'm going to kill you right after you've acquired the sword. And so this is just sheer nonsense of fun. So getting back to the in space... The biggest problem with Arcadia Quest is the setup time, and a little finicky, a little bit too much for what it's doing. Five years ago, I was much more forgiving of this. They have kickstarted a new version of Arcadia Quest called Starcadia Quest, which is Arcadia Quest in space. <laughs> <laughs> I, it is! Callback. Callback. Well, yeah. yeah, that was a callback. It does a number of things that I'm excited about. It reduces the complexity of the game. It also says you can set this up in quarter of the time or less. I don't love the swap out for fantasy for space, but, you know, we had to give something to get something. 
So that is Arcadia Quest, uh, one of my favorite games that I have gotten rid of and eagerly awaiting Starcadia Quest. My number one game is a gut punch to everybody because this is the number one game on Board Game Geek. So this is Gloomhaven. I got rid of Gloomhaven. Uh, again, you shipped that somewhere? No, I was a local trade. No, you handed it to someone. I traded Gloomhaven for 1846 and Indonesia. Okay. And I think I also got another copy of Biblios, too. And maybe, you know, 1842 and oh. 1777. And another copy of Gloomhaven, weirdly. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Somehow. <laughs> um, so Gloomhaven as a game, again, I can appreciate. I can appreciate. I can understand why people love it. I can understand why the people can just have Gloomhaven and play nothing else because of how much is in the box. But for me, the setup time and the teardown was way too long. And also... And again, I may not have played it enough. I played nine games of it, so that was enough for me. But for me, it started feeling samey, and there's just too much upkeep. There's just too much fiddliness for it. So I parted ways with the number one game of all time, Gloomhaven. I could be getting rid of my copy very soon because we're finishing out the campaign. Shortly. I wonder if there's a market for a finished, a played through copy of Gloomhaven. Well, so I do have the removable sticker. Oh, nice. So, <laughs> yeah, That's smart. I was thinking ahead, yeah, Colin. He was thinking ahead when he played it brains you know what i'm saying he's the brains of this operation always oh, the brains of the gloomhaven operation okay i'll take it my number one game that i got rid of is terra mystica and the reason might surprise you because it is tempting to say that i traded up for the in space version of terra mystica but i actually got rid of it long before gyro project was a twinkle in anyone's eye <laughs> but terra in space gyro project in space yes terra mystica is actually a game that when I played it, and I played it a few times with, with, with a copy I owned, I didn't love. I think there are a couple of sort of twists to the rules and the restrictions in Terra Mystica and the tightness of the area control element. The map is quite restrictive on where you can place and blocking players feels quite punishing if you're not very good at the game. As someone that had played it more than the people I was playing it with, it was a hard learning curve for those people. And then whenever I would play it with people that played a lot more than me, I felt like I was struggling uphill. It's a game that is quite punishing to skill differences, and I just couldn't get over that hill with either group of gamers I was trying to play it with. One of the things that Gaia Project does do quite smartly and where I'm now quite pleased to have Gaia Project in my collection, is it sort of smooths out those rules edges a little bit. It makes things a little bit more cohesive. It, it adds a couple of more elements, but they all feel connected to the whole. And it also makes the area control aspect a little bit less mean. It allows you sort of to fulfill your space network without sort of feeling like you're just being closed in or are closing others in. And in a game that's that long, that slight dampener on the punishment aspect felt like something that was needed so i am quite happy to have gaia project in my collection and i do not substantially miss terra mystica even though i recognize it as a game that i could have grown to love that is terra mystica that is gonna do it for our top five list of games that we got rid of thank you all for listening to this episode of the board game barrage podcast you can find us on all of our social media that is going to be on Facebook. That is going to be on Twitter. We have an Instagram account where Kellen posts beautiful pictures of the games that we've been playing. So check us out there. We also have a Discord. This is a good place to come talk to us about board games. That is at boardgamebarrage.com slash Discord. And I think this is as good a time as any to join because people in the Discord are starting to organize more digital games. Yeah. And I think in this time of social distancing, what could be better than staying in the comfort of your own home and playing board games with New friends from all over the world. I recently played my first game on Tabletopia, and I was really pleasantly surprised by how that worked out. So uh, it was a game of Haunted Teutonica. So yeah, I would really, really recommend joining the Discord and getting some games going. Uh, yeah, so I think please check that out and feel free to jump in and just ask around and see what people are willing to play. There's a lot of options with Tabletopia, Tabletop Simulator, other board gaming sites. There are a lot of avenues to play these games without having to leave your home. But that is going to do it for the show. Thank you as always to Heart Society for our intro and outro music What's in Your Mind Kid Goodbye See ya So long So I switched the minute timer on my MacBook in the top right corner so that it can show the seconds
okay. to 60. And it's both good and bad. It's like good because if a conference call is about to start, I'm like T minus 30 seconds. <laughs> right. Um, and that's actually helpful, right? Because you don't want to get on two minutes after the call starts, but you want to get on, you don't want to be there five minutes early, uh -huh. but it just amps up the anxiety just a little bit. It's like, Oh, damn, you know, I've got 40 seconds. Better go get my Mountain Dew, get back to my desk. <laughs> Work from home's crazy, yo. Wait, this is a countdown timer for, like, your conference calls? No, so it's it's like, instead of it saying it's 10.49 a.m., oh, I see, it the says clock. it's 10.49 a.m. and 30 seconds. Got it, got it. And so if a call, uh, if a call is starting, you know, right at 11 a.m., before, I would just be guessing, oh, uh -huh. oh minute. maybe it's 20 seconds, maybe it's a minute, who can say? And now I know precisely... <laughs> when to arrive what is the correct time to arrive in a meeting in seconds late presumably are you the client or are you being serviced wait isn't the client being serviced yeah that was bad <laughs> are you servicing the client or are you being serviced i am always being serviced um if you are running the call and neither of you have ever you know run a conference call or you know been a professional businessman uh you would want to be there probably at least three or four minutes early okay um you can start checking to see if you're uh able to present and share your screen uh etc cetera, etc cetera. if someone joins early you know it's like oh who just joined oh hello you know it's so annoying oh my oh, gosh art to it there, there is art. No, I, I believe it. I'm being genuine. Yeah. How do you talk to people you don't know and have never met and don't want to meet? I choose not to at every opportunity. Yeah, you're an artist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going. Hello, everyone. And well, oh, that was weird. Sorry about that. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 uh, mm, uh, the, the, challenge uh, uh, of that <laughs> yeah. is that yes but you do want me to record this now though yeah just say i launched lords of hellas from my tank cannon <laughs> do oh. that say that Neil. <laughs> i i say that, Neil. I, uh, I launched it from my tank cannon <laughs> from my from tank my, cannon from my trunk tank cannon <laughs> from my long tank cannon <laughs> yep um you're not gonna I'm say. I'm not it? gonna say that. Why? <laughs> Do you know the ridiculous. things that I've said that he's made me say? <laughs> made you say anything? He makes me I say, made you say. I don't make you say anything. You lies say every, every time. time, and then you put it at the end. <laughs> I don't make you say. It. I highlight it. I don't make you say it. <laughs> okay. I just noticed that the Diet Dr Pepper says on the top, "You deserve this." What the hell is that? Are you serious? You really like that? That was Kellen's response as well. Like, I was what like, the f*** is this? It. I hate no, you that. weren't. You I mean, that. I don't hate that. I'm like, but I mean, of course I deserve this. I, who questions the fact that I deserve a Diet Dr. Pepper? It Well, it reminds me of, because the Starbucks one, um, the Starbucks cups have that first sip feeling on the side. Oh, I don't even I drink Starbucks. Yeah, but for some reason, like, when I see that, I just like... It's like the first sip you drink is good and then it's like garbage, you know, or like <laughs> a lot of times you get a drink and you only you only needed like a little bit to sure. get you through it. Yeah. So that first sip, I'm like, OK, well, now I don't need this. But you deserve this. Yeah, that's that's uh, self-affirming for less than a quarter a can. I mean, in Neilan's case, free because I bought his ass. But <laughs> <laughs> I just he's I, getting one of those a day. The idea that they're telling me I deserve this is like ridiculous i'm but i i mean it's tied to indulgence right like yeah. so that's what they're trying you can indulge in dr pepper right with none of the negative baggage you yeah. deserve it uh, uh, but i mean of it, course you I got, got no it even yeah, I, got, I didn't get got, <laughs> got sucker punch got. to, the, to gut. the gut by dr pepper not our favorite doctor on the podcast <laughs>